Good evening, friends. We want to welcome all of those who are joining us online on Facebook to this very special Q&A session following our presentation this evening. Thank you for staying with us. And also those of you right here in the audience, we're glad you are here. We've had a lot of questions coming in over the last 24 hours on a variety of subjects, so we've kind of tried to cluster them somewhat, but we got a lot of stuff to cover, Pastor Doug, so all right, we'll, we'll see how many questions here. we can do. The first question we have is, is a challenging one. Can you explain to me the meaning of Trinity, the Trinity? Well, you don't find the word Trinity in the Bible. The word Trinity is really a composite of the words a tri, a tricycle means three entity, the three person entity of God. Uh, the Bible talks about God the Father clearly. The Bible talks about God the Son and God the Spirit. Now, there's some people that struggle. They say, how can Jesus be God and be begotten of the Father? Well, Christ, of course, was begotten in the incarnation when God became a man, but he existed before. It says, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And who spoke to Moses at the bush? I am that I am. And the Bible says, in the beginning, God created. You read on, it says in John, all things that were made were made by him. The Word, Jesus, created all things, and yet it says God created. You do the detective work. The Bible says only God can forgive sin, but Jesus could forgive sin. The Bible says there's only one Savior, but it says Jesus is Savior. And you look at all the definitions of God, and Jesus ends up filling all of those definitions. And so um, we believe in God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Jesus said, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you find a number of scriptures and examples that support that through the Bible. Um, I've even got a little book if people, you can download it for free. It's called The Trinity. Is it biblical? And we just put together some of the verses there on that. Okay, our next question is, what do you say to people who believe in aliens? Build a wall. No. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're not talking about that. We're talking about, they're thinking, I think they're talking about like aliens from outer space that come down. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I was being bad. You're going to get letters on that one, Pastor Doug. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, uh, well, of course, we have angels. An alien is talking about, you know, some supernatural being. And a lot of people said, I saw UFOs or I was captured by aliens. And, you know, I don't believe that. Some people may have had encounters with demonic spirits and they said they were aliens um, and then you've got some who read in Genesis chapter 6 where it said the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they procreated with them and they said were those fallen angels were they aliens and I've heard all kinds of really bizarre theories about that but our world is pretty much quarantined from the rest of the universe because this sheep is lost we have a disease called sin down here. Christ came to seek and to save this planet. And someday we once again will be able to talk to unfallen worlds. And I do believe there are other unfallen worlds. The um, Bible says, what is it Hebrews chapter 2? That God created through, the world. Created the world. Yeah, it's Hebrews 1, verse Hebrews 2. One. Yeah. Yes. Through Christ, God created the worlds, plural. And you read in Revelation about the 24 elders around his throne. And and then Job, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And it's not on earth. So there's some other heavenly meeting taking place. And many believe maybe these sons of God are leaders of other realms or worlds. And so we do believe there's other life, but they are not allowed to interact with our world while we have this disease. Only the angels. Next question that we have is, did Jesus spend three days and three nights in the grave? You know, I touched on this briefly in the message. Um, some people think about the verse where Christ says in Matthew chapter 12, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And they automatically assume part of the earth means the tomb. Well, Jesus died Friday afternoon and went to the tomb before sundown rose Sunday morning, so that's Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning. You've got part of three days, but you've only got two nights no matter how you cut it. And I've met people before that try to move the day of the crucifixion. Have you? They say, oh, it was really Wednesday or something else. And no, you don't need to do that, friends. Uh, when it says heart of the earth there, 
it's talking about, in, and the word heart there is cardia in Greek, and it means the midst or the clutches of the world. As Jonah was a captive of the whale in the darkness for three days and three nights, the Son of Man would be bearing the sins of the world. When did Jesus begin to actually suffer for our sins? When the nails pierced his hand? Or when in the Garden of Gethsemane he said, Now is the hour of darkness, and the mob arrested him, and he began to be tortured. So he was in the heart of the earth. It's not the tomb. Where else in the Bible does it call the, in the heart of the earth the tomb? When you pray the Lord's Prayer, you say, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You don't mean in the tomb, right? So when he says in the heart of the earth, he means I would be in the clutches of this lost world and the prince of the world, the devil, mm -hmm. for three days and three nights, suffering the penalty for our sins. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. After he prayed the third time in the garden, not my will, thy will be done, then the mob came and his sufferings began. That's what he's talking about. Our next question that we have is, what are we going to be doing during the millennium, thousand years in heaven? Yeah, well, it, it tells us that we live and reign with Christ. It says, judgment was given unto the saints. Paul said, do you not know you will judge angels? And so there's some investigation going on. It's also, I, I think we're going to do some recuperation. Uh, it's like a thousand year R&R. &R. You know, most, you add up the ages in the Bible, you get creation approximately 6,000 years ago. And the millennium is how long? A thousand years. That's what milli annum. And it's almost going to be like a thousand year Sabbath. And so um, we'll be resting and, and uh, spending time with Jesus, but we'll be involved in asking and answering a lot of questions during the millennium. You know, um, we might see some people are not in heaven that we thought should be there. We'll say, Lord, how come they're not here? He'll take us to the record books. You might see some people there and you think, what in the world are they doing here? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine being Stephen? last thing Stephen sees is Saul is an accessory to his execution and then Stephen gets to heaven and the angels are carrying Saul on their shoulders in the heavenly parade and Stephen's going what in the world you guys got it wrong this time what's he doing here and the angels say well come here we'll show you the DVD except it'll be a 3D DVD back then and he say he was converted and he became a great soul winner matter of fact he wrote nearly half the New Testament and your testimony had something to do with converting him. And they go, oh, okay, I feel better. I guess I can go shake his hand then. And so we'll be having a lot of questions answered. I got a question when I get to heaven. I need to talk to Jacob. And I need to ask Jacob, and I'll, I'll ask him privately, how come you didn't know it was Leah until the morning? <laughs> Am I the only one that hasn't wondered about that? And maybe I should never ask him that question, but... Next question that we have is, how do I make reading the Bible a priority in my busy life when there are so many other things competing for my time and my attention? You find time for what you want. Mm. Amen. Do you find time to eat? And some people are so busy, they don't find much time to eat. But people usually find time to keep themselves alive. You need to find time to keep yourself alive spiritually. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We need the Word of God. And you need to just carve it out. Make an appointment. Um, my son on his phone, it beeps every now and then. I said, what's that? He said, it was an alarm. He said, I was reminding myself to pray. Or remind himself, I heard a little girl that every night before she went to sleep, she'd take her shoes and toss them under the bed. And her mother said, why do you do that? She said, I got to get on my knees in the morning to dig them out and it makes me remember to pray while I'm on my knees. <laughs> you do whatever you need to do to ensure that appointment with God. But you just got to, you have to have that time. You just, you have to have that time. Next question that we have is, what is the difference between being baptized into Christ and being baptized into a church? Well, there shouldn't be a difference. Um, I know that there's some people who say, well, you know, we're going to baptize you into Christ now. And later when you get done drinking and smoking, we'll baptize you into the church. That's unbiblical. Because when a person is baptized into Christ, it represents a new birth, a new beginning. It represents that they have been liberated. They're, they're, they're all, old things are passed away. They're a new creature. And the idea that 
that they're two separate things. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, they were baptized and added to the church. So baptism is connected with being part of the body of Christ, which is the church. You are connected with Christ through baptism, through his body. And the church is the earthly representation of the body of Christ. You and I are different members of his body, right? And so there really shouldn't be a difference there. And so now there are some churches that baptize people that they really haven't accepted Jesus. And that's an unfortunate and sometimes people are in a hurry to baptize someone before they're really converted. And um, they, that's unfortunate too. When Jesus comes back, will Satan be visible? We were talking about this question backstage. It's a good question. Um, John reminded us that it says, uh, then that wicked one will be revealed. Satan is going to at some point impersonate Christ or personate Christ. And so he may, like I said, either possess somebody. We're not exactly sure how he's going to do it, but there'll be something visible that he does that we can see. And when Christ comes, whether he still retains that, probably at some point when we get our glorified bodies. Uh, did, are there angels in the room now? Yes. Yeah. Can you see them? No. Why not? Could Adam and Eve see angels? Yeah. I believe they could. I believe Adam and Eve had garments of light and after they sinned they lost the whole spiritual dimension. They lost their garments of light. They lost the ability to see the spirit world. But they used to see the spirit world the way you and I see each other. When we get our glorified bodies will we again see angels? Mm -hmm. Good and bad? So at the end of the 1,000 years we'll see Satan, right? Mm -hmm. Getting and his demons getting their just reward. So how much we'll see when Jesus comes? I think that our eyes will be opened in the in the end. Next question is, I am able to, am I able to play sports in college and keep the Sabbath? Well, those can end up being two different masters. Mm -hmm. um, we got a call at Amazing Facts a couple of years ago. Uh, a young man and his father had been watching our programs. He had, his life goal was to play for the New York Jets. He got drafted. And it all happened right about the time he was watching our programs and he became convicted on the Sabbath truth. I'm not going to tell you his name. Um, and he called us up and said, please pray for us. For the father called to pray for my son because he's told his coach. said, no, I know I've written a contract. I know I've decided to work this, but I can't play on Sabbath. And uh, the coach told him, he said, this may be a problem. And last I heard, they said, we're going to give you Saturday games off for now, but we're not going to promise that it's going to continue. You, you need to put God first. How many of you remember that famous story about Eric Little? Even though he had the day wrong, he had the principle right. Mm -hmm. He refused to run an Olympic event for his country because it was on Sunday, and he believed Sunday was the Sabbath. And the Lord blessed him. You know, even he winked at his ignorance about the day, but he blessed his sincerity. He made up his mind. He said, look, the Sabbath is a Sabbath that doesn't matter if I lose this opportunity or what I lose, I'm putting God first. Now, it's a whole different question about sports. Because sports can actually, a person can get obsessed. Let's face it, in some countries they worship different games. It's almost like in a religious event. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Their team loses and they riot up the streets. And so they're... If a person is not of the same denomination, is it okay to be in a relationship with them? Depends on what kind of relationship we're talking about. Uh, you know, Paul, of course, tells us we should not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Well, if you have no relationship with unbelievers, you can't even give them a Bible study. But if you're thinking about somebody with romantic interest, don't even begin to tease that you're going to date that person and hope to convert them. Um, I've seen a lot of people got married and they said, well, I know they don't believe, but their heart is good and I, they're really attractive and you know, love is blind. People, they, they you know, fall for somebody and they say, oh, but you know, they don't reason clearly when they fall in love with somebody. They become infatuated. And they think, I'll change him, I'll change her. And you know what often happens. The other person changes them. Mm -hmm. Or they change each other, it's usually the case. And don't begin thinking of a person as a romantic future, uh, you ought to have someone else give them Bible studies. <laughs> so being in a relationship with people, if you can be friends, and that's, you know, that's how you can share your faith. 
but you don't even want to consider a person romantically or to be a life partner if um, they don't share your faith. Amen? Amen. Can I cook on the Sabbath? Veggie links. <laughs> this is the only thing. <laughs> now, the Bible's pretty clear. Uh, bake what you're going to bake. Seed what you're going to see. You should do the whole idea of the Sabbath is get as much out of the way as you possibly can so that you have that time without the, the hurry, scurry. You can rest. You don't want to be rip snorting around the kitchen like Martha, Sabbath. Uh, the Bible's clear. The children of Israel would gather the manna Friday. They would bake it, boil it, cook it, whatever they did. Um, and uh, Moses actually says, and I don't remember the reference, bake what you're going to bake, seed or boil what you're going to boil, and get your food ready. It's wonderful today because we have refrigerators and microwaves. You can make your salad and, and put it in the refrigerator and you can cook all your food and, and just warm it up. And Praise the Lord for time, time bake ovens, right? Just press a button on your way to church, you come home and it goes ding and it's ready. So the whole idea is you want it to be labor minimum so that you can rest on that day. Amen? Amen. Is it okay to be cremated? Well, wait until you're dead <laughs> before you do it. Um, typically in the Bible, when people were cremated, <laughs> I'm sorry. I really didn't think of that until I saw it. I thought, well, no, not, not yet. <laughs> um, but typically in the Bible, when people died, they were buried. Um, there is one or two examples where someone was cremated and they'll be saved. You know, Jonathan and his father were killed by the Philistines. The men of Jabeth Gilead rescued the remains of Saul and his sons from the walls of Beth Shan. And uh, they gathered them and burned them. And David praised them for their heroic deed. Um, so there are a few cases. Typically, it's in heathen countries where they cremate. Um, but you might be thinking, well, Pastor Doug, it says ashes to ashes. So what difference does it make? You know, if you cremate a person, it just sort of accelerates the process. I, I would not judge a person if they were cremated. I, I think there's going to be, that's something you really need to decide for yourself. Uh, many of the early church fathers and reformers were against cremation, and here's part of the reason. Man is made in the image of God. Even in death, we bear some similitude to the image of God, and the remains should be preserved. The Hebrews typically, um, they buried them. Sometimes they embalmed them even. So you do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. I know regular burial is very expensive compared to cremation. And so you just sort that out. There is no command, thou shalt not cremate in the Bible. I'm just telling you what the example was. When is, a, when is re baptism appropriate? Well, there are probably three times that a person might consider being re baptized. One is if you were never baptized biblically, if you were baptized by uh, sprinkling, or if uh, you're you know, baptized as a baby, you would want to be baptized by your choice as an adult by immersion. So be baptized biblically. The second reason is if you have backslidden in a serious way, where you denied the faith, you pretty much divorced yourself from the Lord, you might want to consider talking to your pastor and being rebaptized. But then there's a third reason. You find an example in Acts chapter 19, where these 12 Ephesian believers. They heard about um, the Holy Spirit and John, the, they heard about John the Baptist. They had not heard about Jesus or the Holy Spirit. Paul taught them all these things that they had missed. They didn't have the internet back then. They didn't realize all that had transpired. And when he preached Christ to them, they were baptized. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They had already been baptized by immersion by John the Baptist. But here they were rebaptized. So if you're in doubt, you know, you talk to the pastor. You don't want to be getting baptized every few months or every few years. There's something wrong if you're doing that. It's baptism's like a wedding. It's something that when you do it, you ought to mean it. It ought to be serious and it should last, right? There are occasions you might need to be rebaptized or remarried. I think we have time for two more questions. Are you saying that the literal Ten Commandments on stone in the ark are now in heaven? Yeah, I, I think I br briefly referenced that. Uh, where it says in Revelation that I saw the temple of God open in heaven, I saw the Ark of the Covenant. Um, 
the things that were made on earth, we're talking a little about this tomorrow, are replicas of the real, the original in heaven. So when Jesus stands, or when the high priest stands before the golden box with the two angels on it, in heaven does God have golden angels or are they real angels? When the whole high priest went into the temple and you had the angel golden wallpaper, does God have golden angel wallpaper in heaven or are they living wall of angels? And so when under the angels was the law of God, does God have the real law in heaven? I think the original transcript is there. And so um, he's got a copy. Now, I, I heard some people argue, and this is just something to think about. How many tables of stone were there the Ten Commandments were on? Two. Which side were they written on? It says written on both sides. But then we hear that there's, you know, four on one and six on the other. But, you know, when you make a covenant with somebody, if I make an agreement with you and we write up a contract, how many copies do you get? Do I get it? Do you get it? Do we both get a copy? You both get a copy. Maybe God's got his copy in heaven. There's something to think about. It's a covenant. Final question for today. How do I start a conversation with someone about the Bible or Jesus? That's a good question. Uh, if it's someone you don't know, you need to kind of evaluate where they are. And there's some, sometimes some uh, training programs that will tell you some wonderful uh, diplomatic loving questions you can ask. Maybe you've heard about the, uh, the fort. That means you talk to them maybe about their family. O, occupation. R, religion. T, testimony. Give them your, your personal testimony. Draw them out. Find out what their background is. Um, sometimes you can just say, you know, we, we just were at, uh, we played, played a game of racquetball. And, <laughs> and the guy who signed us in, he said something about God bless. And oh boy, I keyed on that. As soon as he said God bless, I keyed on that. And I said, are you a Christian? He said, yeah. And so, open the door. We left him some lessons for these programs today. And so you just got to be listening because everyone's in a different place. So how do you start a conversation? It depends on the person. If you know a person believes in God, boy, that's just your light years ahead. If the person is an atheist, you got some work to do. You got to build a relationship and just maybe show your testimony and get them thinking. And so let's pray for wisdom. It's different with every person. You know, Jesus, he said to Nicodemus, you got to be born again. And yet he said to the woman at the well something very different. And so it depends on the individual. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for this evening for our Bible questions. We will be doing this again tomorrow. So I want to invite our Facebook friends to stay on again following the program tomorrow evening. Go ahead and post your Bible questions right there on Facebook, and we'll try and get as many of them as we can. So until tomorrow, God bless. Amen. God bless. And we hope we see you tomorrow. Thank you for coming tonight. Amen.